This is a story called What to Do About Wasps. The vicar of Fetching Down hated wasps. I mean, really hated them. He loathed them so much that he kept a table tennis bat beneath the Bible on the pulpit, which at times he would wield with great force, swatting the yellow and black beasts, often during a sermon, and then he would replace it without comment. This was unfortunate for those seated on the first few rows of pews, for Reverend Knott was a remarkably good shot. Pity the tired labourer, exhausted from digging ditches all week, stretched out on the cramped wooden seats, resting his aching limbs, drifting off from the soporific voice intoning the word of God, only to find, as he let out a terrific yawn, an angry jasper thwacked against his larynx and involuntarily travelling down his windpipe. Or... Old Mrs. Dockett, blinded by a hard-batted blighter, straight in her unexpecting eye socket. The ancient walls and monuments and effigies of St. Christopher's proclaimed years of skilful attacks on the flying insects, bodies of squished wasps, bees, hoverflies and bluebottles peppered the internal body of the Saxon church. It was an ongoing problem. The stinging menace had been nesting in the rafters for as long as anyone could remember, and all remedies to eradicate them had failed. Smoking, drugging, drenching, these were mere temporary fixes, for the moment your back was turned, another nest appeared, as if waiting in the wings and installed by the council's rehousing scheme. Dorothy Mully had been stung so many times that her legs were permanently swollen. She could no longer walk without the aid of a zimmer frame, while her arms had scars resembling deep craters on the moon. She was the organist, was being the operative word. She refused to play any more, since her fingers had been so traumatised that she could no longer twinkle the ivories but neither could she turn the sheet music or pull out all the stops. Last summer, two independent nests had settled in the large organ's pipes, causing huge amounts of chaos above the parishioners' heads during the warm, drowsy summer, with their clear hatred of one another. The buzzing aerial displays were likened to dogfights during the Battle of Britain. The angry daredevils resented the low register of Here Comes the Bride vibrating in their new home foundations, so they took to the air en masse, just as the poor wife-to-be came hobbling down the aisle, arms flailing like a demented windmill. For most of August and September that year, bridal dress designers had clearly been influenced by beekeepers' attire, the veil now pretty much encapsulated not only the head, but the body, the arms, the legs, everything. That fetching down's pest problem had not been sorted wasn't the question. Reverend Knott had spoken with Squire Crabtree on more than one occasion, catching him for a brief chat on his way to the faggot and bucket at two in the afternoon, and then again at two in the morning, when the pub's doors were finally unbolted after a lengthy lock-in. The answer, however, was always the same, although admittedly more coherent in the afternoon than in the wee small hours. The bishop! Ask the bishop! It's his church, dear boy! The squire repeated. But it was no good, as everyone knew, consulting the bishop. That avenue had been tackled long ago, to no avail. Apart from Bob Belson's great responsibility in his Episcopal See at Boverington Malady, he had an attitude problem. He liked the yellow and black buggers. And to add insult to injury, he kept his own bees and sold the honey at church fates. In fact, there were six pots behind the altar right now at St Christopher's. No, no, Bishop Belson wouldn't lift a finger. 
Dorothy Mully couldn't lift a finger and Reverend Knott had church warden Sally Finkmuscle poking her finger in his ribs to rid him of the church monsters. Or she was retiring for good this time. And so was Ollie Dewbucket, the tower captain and lead bell ringer. And without those expert naggers, the meagre 13 parishioners would never remember to sleep in the pews on a Sunday morning and snore through the Reverend Knott's religious diatribe. It was a helpless stalemate. Although Percy Goodbetter, gravedigger, mole catcher, ferret fancier and rat enticer, had a trick up his sleeve if anyone wanted to pay him the respect to listen to it and buy him a quart of dreadful dewdrop down at the faggot and bucket. Lure them out with cake. That was his suggestion. Not any kind of cake, but lemon drizzle cake. Reverend Knott liked this idea. Cake was his favourite pastime, the very reason he became a priest, in fact. The perks of visiting all the elderly women of the district and listening to their woes and answering their concerns about the afterlife was made bearable by stuffing copious amounts of home-baked sugary stuff into his cake hole. More tea, vicar, was more than often greeted with more cake, please. So yes, lure the pests out of the church with luscious, scintillating lemon drizzle cake. Percy Goodbetter insisted the bait had to be baked on the premises. Get them agitated like, he proclaimed. The wasps would smell the cake as it was weighed, mixed and baked in situ. And then, once made, slowly wheel the yellow oozing confectionery down the aisle and out of the door to the end of the churchyard and down a ramp into a hole six foot deep. And once the wasps were busy feasting at the bottom of the grave, have all the villagers standing by with shovels and fill in the hole swiftly and bury the blighters once and for all. And it could have worked, had not a freak accident do more of a permanent job of removing the wasps from the rafters. As the makeshift oven was heating up, a stray lump of red-hot coal fell out of the firebox, set light to a pile of hymn books. The blaze ignited an ancient tapestry, which in turn torched the old oak beams turning the whole church roof into a flaming inferno. So, for a mere £50,000 repair bill and 900 years of damage, the wasps of fetching down had finally been terminated, and Reverend Knott never had to swat a stripy yellow back ever again. Until the hornets moved in, uh, but then that's another story.